Hello, and welcome to the 50 Women Over 50 podcast. I'm your host, Sherry Lynn Starkey. On this podcast, I highlight women who have broken down barriers, challenged the status quo, or who have simply lived remarkable lives beyond the age of 50. So far, my guests have included pioneering entrepreneurs, passionate activists, artists, educators, and more. Get ready to be inspired, informed, and empowered as together we extol the lives of 50 exceptional women over 50. Today, I'm welcoming freelance journalist Nicola O'Connell to the show. As a renowned healthcare and medical writer, Nicola has had hundreds of articles published in specialist trade and prestigious medical journals, and she regularly contributes to consumer media outlets. In this interview, she shares her experiences of being in the sandwich generation, where she still has young children at home and is caring for her mother, all while juggling a demanding career and a busy life in London. Okay, let's start at the beginning. Tell me about your 50th birthday. My 50th birthday was a bit of an anticlimax, really, because I kept it a secret from only those who I've known long enough to know that I was turning 50. So nobody else was privy to that information. And even those who knew, I still didn't feel like making a song and dance of it. So I definitely didn't want a party. Now I look back, should I have done a party? Mm, maybe I should have. I don't know. The only turn 50 once and all that. But it, I just didn't, wasn't that happy about it, I suppose. And But I did want to mark it. So I had a nice celebration with, well, with family celebration. And I had a couple of separate celebrations with different friends rather than getting them all together. So I, when I say like I had a mini I can't really call it a party, but I think I gathered about eight or nine friends, maybe not even in a bar and they knew, (laughs) but it was, it was just an evening out. I didn't, yeah, that was it. I just did a couple of, and then I had a nice lunch with some local friends, but I didn't, they knew it was my birthday, but I did not reveal which one. So it was just a regular birthday celebration. Very nice. We had champagne, but nobody knew. So didn't really feel a big thing. I didn't make a big deal of it. And I don't know whether I'm going to regret that or not at the time. At the time, it's just not what I wanted. So that was that really. And why did you feel so trepidatious about turning 50? It's a very good question. And I don't even have a good answer because I think I partly blame my mother because growing up, she never revealed her age and she would pretend she was 10 years younger. Uh-huh. And I think this just goes back a few generations. I think her mother was the same. Her family was the same. So it was ingrained into me not to reveal the information. When I was younger, I thought it was crazy. Then I hit about 35 and found myself buying into it yeah. for no good reason. I just suddenly didn't want to start saying, I was still okay, Rob. But even when I remember turning 40, even then I didn't really tell people. I was, I kept that. I think people knew, but I didn't really actually, I never said the actual number. <laughs> 40. So when I was turned 50, it somehow felt even more of a secret. And and I don't want to say ashamed, but I guess I just felt like I don't want to feel like an old woman. I don't want to feel this. I don't want to feel middle-aged. And I think that was, I think 40, you can say in these days, 40, we don't have to feel is quite middle-aged. You could argue it's early middle-aged, but it's still young. But 50, you can't really continue that. You, I think by 50, you have to admit it's middle age. And somehow I just did not want to feel middle-aged. So it just didn't really feel like something I wanted to celebrate at the time. Yeah. And I think just being a little bit in denial as well about, again, just wanting to, to stay feeling younger, even though the number was saying something different. I, you know, I totally hear you about this because I, I felt very much the same way myself. But I, I can imagine for you, because I know by the age of your children, you you, you weren't living a middle aged lifestyle. No, no, you I did the life of I, a thirty year old. <laughs> well, well, yes, for for the those for those who have children very young, but I, I suppose others most. Well, I think I'm quite lucky in London because I'm not the only one in my fifties among my among the mums, put it that way, yeah. but maybe all different stages of fifties. But it's, I've got a group, I've got a book club, for example, there's six of us, four of us are in our fifties. So that just shows I don't feel completely alone being the age I am, but I think they, I, st- I still think I've got, well, think, no, I've got, I've got a good couple of years on them. 
but 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 yeah, you're right. I wasn't living a middle age. I'm still not living a middle. Age. My children are still young. They're still 13 and 10. So I'm still not living that middle age lifestyle. So no, I didn't yeah. want to be. I didn't want to feel like I was either. I didn't really want to celebrate going into middle age at a time I didn't feel I was that stage of life. Yeah. So I totally hear you on that. Because the year that I turned 50, I became a grandmother. And I, I oh, was, wow. Yeah. All oh, right. Okay. I was really? Oh, oh, we're here now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Maybe, maybe it was easier for you to accept then if you were a grandmother that you were. Oh, I didn't really accept it. I only accepted it this year. The year that I turned 60 is the year that I accepted that I was in my 50s. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's, there's, there's no age defined so much these days, I don't think, yeah. because we're all doing different things at different ages. I suppose if you go back some years that when women were mostly having children in their 20s and it was a different and, and a lot of women weren't, weren't working either. I'm going back a few generations, obviously, but now we're all, everyone's doing something different, aren't they? Some people are having children at 20, others at 45 or even 50. I've got two friends who've done the the egg donation thing. So it's it's. Yeah. We're all just, it's a different time of life and yeah, yeah, it's these perceived ideas of what we should be doing when I, a lot of it's gone out the window. And, and as far as like what a conventional 50 year old woman is supposed to be doing, I didn't, I didn't feel at all like that was me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's taken my, this podcast project for me to get my brain around it, but I am there where you are now, where it's being at this, in this cohort is nothing like what my mother's generation faced. And what I'm discovering through this podcast series is that women our age are just so excited about what's opening up to them now. <laughs> yeah. It's like this yeah. second stage of their life, for sure. Yeah. And we don't feel old and we don't feel ready to throw in the towel and we don't feel like we want to start becoming these, these old women and <laughs> we're still out there. Exactly. So what advice would you give your 30-year-old self? Well, I think I would tell her, be ambitious, but don't focus 100% on your career. First of all, I think I would say, accept that you need to grow up. Because I think when I was 30, I was still very much living the, well, I would not say quite the student life because I was, obviously wasn't a student, but I was still just, it was all about social life. And the idea of having a family at that time was was scary. It was all about work. I had a job. I had a job that was great. I was self-employed at that stage and it was going well and I was loving my freedom and I was loving the work I was doing. I had a, an acceptable income, so I had money to travel, do things I wanted to do. But I probably was, I mean, so I had, I had all of that, but I, but aside from that, it was all about career, career, career. Mm. And maybe at that stage, I would have, it would have been better for me to start thinking a little bit more about something beyond career. So there's that. What else would I have, what I've told myself? Financial foundations, probably a little bit more. I think if somebody had given me a wad of money back then, I would have just wanted to spend, spend it. Whereas now I think there's never, you're never too young to start doing some of those financial foundations, putting X amount, investing X, whatever it might be, property or whatever is a sensible investment, because it comes around quickly. I think that's the thing I would say to my 30 year old. You feel now, you feel like you're going to be young forever. You feel like you're going to be in your 30s forever, but it comes around very quickly before yes. you know it. You're in your 50s. And if you don't have those financial foundations, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't bad. It wasn't like I was terrible. I set up my pension. I think I was roughly age 30 when I set up my pension. But I still think I could have done more on the financial side of it to set myself up for the future. I would have told myself to be more patient as well, just just generally not expecting everything to happen when you want it to I would have what else would I do trust your gut I think probably that little bit more too when I was younger I guess that comes with being a little bit more insecure at that age mm -hmm. not having the confidence I think by 30 I was starting to gain a lot more confidence but obviously not as much confident as I would have gained by my mid to late 30s but it's hard to have that confidence when you're young I think but but you do, it, you've no reason not to. Sometimes you, you don't, you don't always back yourself because of your age, but I think you can, if you're intuitive enough, if you're smart enough, you, you should be able to back yourself more. And probably I should have backed myself more, back my judgment and gut 
a bit more at that age. This is a um, common theme. And I actually think the young ladies coming up behind us actually do have a little bit more confidence. But I always think that when we're talking about these kinds of concepts about, uh, you know what Helen Marin said, mm -hmm. if she had to do it over again, she would have told a lot more people to fuck off. I saw that. And I love that. Yeah, I really I love that. Yeah. Me, that's me. Like, I, yeah. oh my God. There's so much I should have, I put up with that I never should have, especially career-wise. Yes. You know? <laughs> well, I remember, okay, this is a bit before 30, because I would have been in my, more like my mid-20s, but I had a bully boss. And I just think, why did I let her bully me? And I let her crush my confidence too. Yeah. And, I'm, and I think, wait, look back. Why did you do it? First of all, you should have stood up, stood up to this woman. And, and she was a known bully, by the way. It wasn't just me. I subsequently found out she bullied plenty of others. But why did I let someone like that destroy my confidence as well? So as it goes back to just, just believe in yourself and you're going to come across bullies. You're going to come across people who are going to put you down. You're going to come across assholes. You're going to come across all sorts. Uh, you, you just have to, you have to maintain your own belief in yourself. Yeah. And so that, yeah, that's, and I guess you're right. I can see how as we get older, we would all tell our younger selves that. At the time, it's hard. It's hard to it's feel that hard, way. It's still hard now. Yeah, it is. My husband, and he uh, often, when I'm fed up with stuff at, with my work, he'll say, you know what Helen Mirren would say? <laughs> yeah. What well, I think I'm going to take that quote and, and put it on the wall somewhere <laughs> and just somewhere where I'm going to see it. Because I, yeah, that really, that hit me when I saw it. I just yeah. thought, it's so true. We're just feeling like we have to bow down to so many, so many people all the time. And, and we don't, we don't actually, we just feel like we do. We feel like we always have to be nice. And, and yes, I do think it's important to be nice, you know, yeah. and kind and show consideration and all that. But you, you come across some, some types that do deserve, that don't, they do deserve us saying <laughs> sooner rather than later too. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So what are you doing for fun these days? What am I doing for fun these days? <sighs> sort of a modified version of what I was probably doing 20 years ago, but it is more modified in the way that I feel like I've got some limitations with the family. So I'm not going out as much, but I do still, I still live in, in I still live in the same place. I still live in central London. So I've got everything. I've got no excuse not to go out, meet friends for drinks, dinner. That's probably mostly what I do. It's it's, but then that's probably mostly what I was doing before too. So just not as not as late. Maybe that's the difference. Um, <laughs> I'm not. There's no more. I guess clubbing's gone. Clubbing's probably been replaced with by karaoke, which has been, <laughs> which I'm, which is fun. It's it's fun. But yeah, I think I've, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go clubbing till four a.m. Now, first of all, I would be by far, by far the oldest person in the entire club. And <laughs> secondly, yeah, I think four staying up till four five or whatever time I used to stay up to that's going to hit me harder now then oh, yeah. I like or even though I'm I like to think I can do everything I can do I could do 20 years ago or 30 years ago I always think but I can't because I know that if I stayed up till four I'd feel really rough the next day and rougher than I would have felt when I was younger I'm still swimming reg well semi-regularly at least as regularly as I can which I've been doing for many many years I wouldn't say that's I do it for fun I would do it more for fitness but oh, I still love going out to go to museums, go to exhibitions, and I still love drinking champagne. So all of the, a lot of the things that I used to do just in a, maybe as I say, slightly more modified way. And you mentioned you're in a book club. I am in a book club. Yes. That's fun. Yeah. I don't always read the book, but it's fun <laughs> to me anyway. I still enjoy. We always have a good night. I am not in a book club, but people I know that are in book clubs tell me it's more about the wine than it is about the books. <laughs> oh, definitely. Definitely. Well, I think that there's probably rarely an occasion when all six of us have read, have actually managed to read the book. If two of us, maybe, or three, that's a result that we read it. So there's <laughs> been a, a lot of times when I just haven't managed. But also I, I go off piece sometimes. Sometimes the book, I think mm, a couple of times I've got the book and then not really gotten that into it. And then I've just thought, you know what? Life's too short to be reading a book that I'm not into. So I'll read my own thing. I do. And I do enjoy, I'll go through phases of reading every night and then I'll go through phases of just not reading for weeks. It's just the way it goes. But at the moment I'm reading a book. So I'm, I've got my nightly ritual now. So I like to do read for about half an hour every night. And it's a great routine to get into actually. Right. Yes. I used to do that when I'm, before I needed to wear glasses to read. So now I listen. To, now I listen to books. 
Do you? Okay. The whole glasses thing. That's another depressing thing about that. That's recent. I got away with it for a while, for quite a long time, actually, because I'm short sighted. So I didn't need reading glasses for a while. And then now I do. Mm. And it's, I don't like it. I don't like yeah. that I need glasses. It just, again, it just makes me feel older. And that's, I know. But yeah, it's come. Yeah. I, if the print's really, if it's big enough, I can almost get away with it. But, but then it feels like too much of an effort. My, my, my eyes are too lazy now. So it feels like too much of an effort. Exactly it. That's exactly it. But I still enjoy the actual reading, I think. Just for me, it's not quite the same yeah, it's to, not the to same. listen because it's my imagination's not working as hard. And for me, that's what I enjoy about the, the whole book thing is like really escaping into this other world when your your brain's there. I want my brain to be there. And it's not so much when I'm listening because it's like that part's being done for me too much. And I like to, I feel like I need to do it myself. And also you're a wordsmith, so you love the written word. True. As am True. I. Like yes. There's something about the art of the written word that you appreciate. Yes. That you just can't listen to. You have to read it. <laughs> you have to read it. And and yeah, and I think you're right. And, and being a writer as well, I, I think it's I do actually need to be reading regularly to keep up my vocabulary and just keep up the the thought process as much as anything. And where do you see yourself in 10 years? Oh, okay. Yes. That's a 10 year question. Well, I'd like to be in a bigger house, but that's, I've been saying that for a, saying very that long, for a long time. time yes. I've been saying that for a very long time because I'm, unless I have more money, it's not going to happen in London. Will I be ready to leave London in 10 years? I don't know, but I, I would just like a bigger house because I've I just feel like I can't do certain things in my current house. Cooking is difficult. Not that I'm a, a great cook by any means, but sometimes when I think about baking, baking a cake or making something new, I just think, oh, there's just no space in this kitchen. And it's things like that. And I'm also a bit of a collector of certain antiques and arts and everything's crammed in and I can't even see half of it. So I'd love a bigger house. I'd love to see myself in a bigger house in 10 years. Whether or not that happen, I don't know. I'm looking forward to you know, seeing the boys grow up. Hopefully they'll be university, I guess, 10 years. Yeah, they will be, both of them. Yes, both of them, actually. In fact, mm -hmm. oh, one of them will even be, they'll even be, my gosh, it's just occurred to me that not only will they be, they'll actually be graduates by then, or at least my older son yeah. will be a graduate. So I guess looking forward to oh, having a marriage again, maybe, like once the, <laughs> or maybe not, because I don't know, I hear people say that they actually dread the time their kids leave because it means going back to just that themselves and their husband again so I'm not sure oh, I feel sorry for people who say that because yeah, I, kids are gone a long time you yeah know. I guess I don't it's it's actually hard to imagine what it will be like for e, just Ian and me again but I guess in some ways it's quite nice to think about just focusing on ourselves again because when you've got kids you don't focus on yourselves anymore that goes out the window so that's nice to look forward to I suppose a time when I can have more time for me more time for us and and that book, that book that I've been threatening to write for so long, maybe I'll even manage to do that. I'd love to do it now, but I don't feel it's the most practical time in terms of well, in terms of the time that I have, and and it's a financial thing too. You can't write a, you can't write a book and expect to make good money from it. You have to just write it out, out of love. But I've, it's something I've wanted to do th since I was a child. It's just that there's never been a good time. Maybe in the next ten years. Maybe I maybe that time will come, and that would be nice if it did. Me too for the book. That's my next thing. I'm when I've done this podcast project. That's gonna so be you're going to do it. I'm going to. You're going to do the book. Be and what's it, is it going to be fiction or nonfiction? Well, I think a bit of both because it's going to be a memoir. Ooh. Mm -hmm. Oh wow. Okay. So I don't like. I really haven't thought it through in any great detail, but I have a couple of ideas. And uh, I'm I'm just pushing it down the road until I have the time to think. Mm -hmm. about. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. I've got maybe seven more podcast interviews and then this project will be winding up and I'll have some more more time for that. So that's gonna be my next big thing. No, well, it's good because I think when I when I come to if I come to it, I need to do it at a time when I can be focused on it. And yeah. it's not something I want to be dipping in and out of now and then. I wanna be writing every day I want to have a set time pretty much to sit down and write every day mm -hmm. and so until that time until that part of life comes I don't really want to even tackle it but at the same time I don't want to be 
85 and think I never did write that book. Yeah, so, no, you're you know, right. It's, you're right. It's, it's, but it is financial too, because at the moment I write every word I write, I know I'm making money. So it's, yes, I can't yes. really think like that when you're writing a book. But a friend, even the friends I know who were quite successful with their, with their books, they all say they don't make much money. So oh, it's they just, don't. I'm friends with one of Canada's best selling authors. And mm-hmm. he's still doing consulting. Because... Yeah. 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 It's it's true. Unless unless your book gets turned into a movie or something like that, I suppose. You gotta do it for love and you've got to do it at a time when you you're not really you, you can afford. You have to be able to, it's a luxury. It's actually a little bit of a luxury. So unless you do it with everything else. But then as I said, then it gets away from that focus I was talking about. Mm-hmm. I love the idea of just being totally engrossed in writing a book just having it take over my life. And because when I've written short stories, which I haven't done for a long time, but that's what it's felt like. You just, you want to just, you can't wait to get back to that story because the idea is you, 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 you get off your computer and then your brain's just going in overdrive, coming up idea after idea. You just cannot wait to sit down and start bashing it out. Again. Right. That's right. That's totally right. Yeah. yeah and that's it's how fun. I want it to be when it, so maybe 10 years. Yeah. Maybe that's what I, what I could be doing. And what are you most hopeful about for the future? Most hopeful. Well, I suppose I would like to. I would like to have some of those achievements done. I'd like to look back and feel that I have achieved some of the things in different ways. This is so not just work, not just the book thing and, and career wise, but I'd like to think my boys have turned out well. <laughs> don't mm-hmm. we all? But that's my hope. I'd like to think I've made some good decisions that that will that have served me well things like yeah I guess that goes back to the financial things we were talking about too and having those foundations hopeful I'd like to think about just having more time just having more time for me again because at the moment I'm very much in the sandwich generation in that I my children are they're growing up they're coming they're definitely becoming more self-sufficient but they still need me I, I guess you could argue kids always do but they'll, it, it, I can feel it's less and less than it was but me my, my mom is aging she needs me more and more in fact yeah she's probably the one who takes up she's, she's more work she's actually become more work than the kids now so that some years in the future when and I won't be quite part of this the sandwich generation anymore it would be nice to be able to feel a bit more free bit more mm-hmm. I can do things myself that I'm not every day restricted by commitments responsibilities for what feels like everybody around me it's not really everybody but it just feels like that at times so yeah that's that's what I look forward to just having that the f- a bit more freedom a bit more time for for just do what I want to do yeah yeah don't worry it's just around it'll be here before you know it <laughs> Well, exactly. Yes. Oliver's already 13. Five more years. We could be down to one child at home, yeah. if, uh, assuming he does go off to uni and, and live elsewhere. But who knows? But if that's the case, he'll probably be back again in two years because nobody can afford property anymore. Uh, it's not not around here, not in London anyway, not unless he goes off to the sticks. He actually, yeah, he's a bit of a country boy, so maybe he will. But but yes, you're right. It's That's that's not far away. Five years is not really... It's, it's a hard seat. It is considering how quickly the last five years went. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And even, you know. even with the pandemic, in some ways, I think the pandemic made the time pass even more quickly because the days blurred into each other. They did completely yeah. blur. And yeah, you think that was March 2020 when it started, right? That's already three and a half years ago. Yeah. Which is wow. Yeah. So that's three and a half years have gone by in a in a snap. So yeah, life is life is zooming on by isn't it? And uh, yes. it's, and I think again, when it, when you hit 50, you realize just how short life is. Because until then, I think the first 40 years, you feel like you've been around forever and you feel like you still have a, long, a very long time too. Well, you hope you do anyway. But once you hit 50, you start realizing that life is actually short and you start doing some scary maths, and especially when you have an older husband like I do. And uh, yeah, and it, and when you do those scary maths, it is pretty daunting. It is. It is. I didn't, I had heard the expression over the hill, like my whole life. Mm-hmm. You, you hear that, right? Always over the hill. It's not until you're over the hill that you actually understand what that expression means about how momentum is gained and everything's speeding up and life starts racing at that point. 
Mm -hmm. And so it's the etymology of that expression or that idiom really comes Mm -hmm. into clear focus (laughs) when you're in it. Well, yeah, it's awful to think you're on the decline, isn't it? When like when you, again, I like to be in denial and I don't feel, I don't really feel like my body's in decline, but I guess I have to accept the fact that it is. It's this little signs of it here. We say the glasses, it's a clear your, your eyes are in decline. And you know, I guess I'm, I'm quite lucky in that I don't really feel like the whole menopausal thing, particularly. I haven't had any symptoms as such, at least, or if I have, they've been subtle symptoms or sometimes it's hard to know if they're if it's the menopause or if it's something like insomnia, is it menopause? But then again, I've always been an insomniac. Anxiety could be menopause, but again, I've always been anxious. I don't, I don't have the hot flushes and all that, the typical symptoms, anything like that. So I don't really feel, I don't don't really feel my body aging so much, even though it's more the physical signs, I suppose. I've noticed the veins on my legs too. I think, oh God, how did these come about? I can no longer wear, I don't dare wear anything above the, above the knee or now. I'm so much more conscientious about the sun and my face and just, and I think, and I remember my mother saying to me when I was younger, you should be wearing sun protection. I remember she just saying, you're going to get wrinkles. You're going to get that. And I said, well, and she, and this, she said, and I no, that's right. And I remember I just said, well, it won't matter because I'll be older then. I just imagine I'd be old. Like, what do you care when you're an old, you're not going to care about how you look when you're an old woman anyway. That was my, my thinking. And she said, no, 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 you will care you will care. She was right. Like, he was right. And I realized you don't actually stop caring about your looks. You don't think, you know, I suppose when I was 20, I just thought, oh, well, when you're, when you're 50, you're, you're, you're over the hill anyway. Nobody's going to look at you twice. So you're not going to be, you're not going to care if you have wrinkles. No, <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking. So wrong. I care very much about having wrinkles or anything else. So yeah, my whole perception of how I imagined this middle-aged woman being when I was, okay, well, yeah, we are talking young, we're talking early twenties, but back then I probably thought fifties, you just think you're, you're so past it, but none of that <laughs> stuff is going to matter to you anymore. You're not going to be, you're not going to be out meeting men anymore unless you're, well, unless you're divorced, but chances are you'll probably be married. And I used to, that's what I, this is all the things I'd say to myself, you're not going to care, but you yeah. are reminding me of my mother imploring me as a teenager to please wear a bra. And I was looking at these, <laughs> look at these babies, mom. I don't need a bra. Pretty perky. And she was like, but they won't always be if you don't wear a bra now. And I was, when I'm old, I'll wear a bra. I'm not wearing one now. And she was like, you know, Sherilyn, there are occasions where when you're older that you might want to not be wearing a bra. <laughs> <laughs> Just ever so subtly plant that idea you're in your head. <laughs> it took me a couple of minutes for her to be this understand what she was, what the implication was there. Anyway, I started wearing one. <laughs> okay. Let's go to the quick round. Okay. Go on, off, go on, off, yes. off the top of your head. First thing yes. that comes to your mind. What yes. are you, what are you reading? What are you watching? What are you binging? Oh, okay. I'm reading People Who Knew Me by Kim Hooper, which is all about this woman who fakes her own death. So she, 9-11, she, she's in New York and she pretends that she's dead to all everybody who knows her and she takes off to LA starts a whole new life and and a lot of interesting things going on it goes back and forth between the current day and that time in New York to lead us up to why she did what she did and it's and I'm getting to the point in the book where I'm starting to realize why she did what she did so yeah I'm really enjoying it is there an app you couldn't live without honestly probably whatsapp (laughs) Okay. <laughs> Just, I'm very reliant because it's because it's so great for international communications. Anything else? Google Maps probably would be the other one oh, because yeah. I've one. good one. <laughs> I've never had a good sense of direction. It's certainly not getting any better as I'm getting older, and I don't know actually how I managed before without it. Really? I actually, I really <laughs> don't because I'm often, I've, I think I roughly know where I'm going, and I'll get out at a tube station, and it's kind of all going horribly wrong. And then I'll get on Google Maps. And is there an over 50s life hack you'd like to share? Well, I guess I'd say never let anybody make you feel old as well. Never let anybody make you feel like you're just too old for anything because you're not. And and again, I think if there's some perceptions that you're that you're meant to not be doing certain things at a certain age. And I say, I say, fuck that, really, because I just say <laughs> I just 
really, I, I'm just going to do what I want to do. They're within limits because even though we talk about the confidence, being more confident, I, there is an embarrassment factor. I would feel silly doing some things at my age, but other than that, no, I'm just going to, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to fall into any, any categories. I really hate when people talk about over fifties, this and over fifties, that as if, as if I'm somehow supposed to feel like this is me. I don't feel like this is me and I don't want to feel like this is me necessarily. I find that there are services out there, but I remember I used to write for an over 50s magazine and it was all things about old people lifestyles that we would, the articles I used to write. And this is, I was a lot younger myself, so I wasn't really thinking so much about it. But when I look, think now, oh, I think- incontinence products. <laughs> well, you know, yeah. Well, I think I actually did write an article on incontinence as it happens. Yes. <laughs> but just the things, the like the lifestyle ideas and as if you're supposed to be meeting this much calmer life suitable for- somebody who can't get around that much. And okay, yes, I realize over 50 does include people 70s, 80s beyond who who don't have mobility in that. But the fact that it's all lumped together over 50s that, yeah. that, that we're supposed to feel like we're falling into this category. So I'd say, no. There's a big, there's a big difference between 50 and 90. A big difference. Yes. Well, <laughs> yes, I would certainly hope so. <laughs> So yeah, I guess I guess these would be some of my some of my hacks. Just yeah, just be yourself, really. Don't and don't let don't have any don't fall into any stereotypes of any kind either. This has been Fifty Women Over Fifty, a podcast for women whose personal confidence is born of experience. Thank you to my guest, freelance journalist Nicola O'Connell. I value her advice not to let anyone put us in the over fifty box. Just be yourself, she says. Don't. Let yourself fall into anyone else's stereotypes. Very wise words. See the show notes to find links to Nicola's socials, her work, and to information about some of the other things we talked about on the show. Thank you for listening. And if you enjoyed the show, please share a link to it with your friends or drop me a rating or a review on Apple or wherever you get your podcasts from. It really does help other people find the show. You can also find it on YouTube and please follow me on social. Let's connect. Let's create a whole community of wise women over 50. See you next time on 50 Women Over 50. I'm your host, Sherry Lynn Starkey.